Hey, what's up everybody? My name is Moss, and in this video, I'm going to introduce you to synthetic monitoring in Splunk Observability Cloud. First, I want to quickly define what synthetic monitoring is, and then we'll jump into a demonstration. Synthetic monitoring is essentially a way for you to simulate a end user experience. So for example, I have a sample application called Online Boutique, and it's an e-commerce site where I can purchase products. As an e-commerce application, there are critical end user workflows that you want to make sure are always available. An example of a workflow might be a user coming to the site, selecting a product, adding that product to the cart, and then placing an order. When an issue is occurring with one of these critical workflows, you want to know about it before your users do. And synthetic monitoring allows you to do that by essentially just running an automation script on a regular cadence performing those critical workflows on your application. And when the script completes, it should report back those results, including things like screenshots and video recordings of the transactions that the script took. And Splunk Observability Cloud offers a very robust synthetic monitoring solution. Let's set up a simple synthetic monitoring test for this online boutique. I'm going to navigate to Splunk Observability Cloud. And then from the home page, I'll select Synthetics. On the Synthetics home page, you can see a list of all of the Synthetics tests that you've already set up. And you can filter that list based off of various parameters like test type or locations. I'm going to select Add New Test. And in the dropdown, you can see that there's three types of tests that I could create a browser, an API test, and an uptime test. The test that I described for the online boutique would be considered a browser test. But if the online boutique exposed an API, you could also run synthetic monitoring on the API as well. Or for a more basic test, you could run an uptime test. You could run a test to make sure that you get an OK response from an HTTP endpoint, or even test the accessibility of a port on a server. As I mentioned before, in our case, we're just going to do a simple browser test. To create a browser test, I'll give it a name. And then I can also add custom properties. Properties are key value pairs that you can associate with a test. And then you can filter tests from the synthetic monitoring homepage based on their key value pairs. Adding custom properties to tests is a good practice because it allows you to organize tests into logical groupings. For instance, I might want to group tests by the environment that they're running in. So some of my tests might be running in a staging environment or a development environment, or they're running in a production environment, and I would want to group those tests by the environment. And I think the same kind of practice should be applied to naming as well. You want to make sure that your naming can be easily filtered and searched, so you would probably want to agree on a naming convention for the names of your synthetic tests. Now under the steps section is where you would actually define what steps the automation script is going to take on your application when it reaches your application's website. You'll notice here that you can import steps. And in this video, we aren't going to import the steps. We'll define the steps in the tool. So I'll select Edit Steps. And from this page, we can add additional steps or transactions to the test. Now what you see here is the first step of a transaction and the transaction is called new synthetic transaction. And this isn't a great, uh, a very descriptive name for this transaction. So I'm going to call it um, online boutique homepage. A transaction is a logical grouping of steps. So you can have multiple transactions like going to the homepage and then a second transaction in the test might be going to a product page and then a third transaction might be purchasing that product. And each of those transactions can have multiple steps. So let's take a look at the first step of the online boutique homepage transaction. If I click on the dropdown, you'll be able to see all of the actions that you can take in this step. And when I scroll to the bottom, you can see there's also an assertion section. So I can actually validate prior actions that were taken. So for instance, maybe after I purchase a product, I should be taken to a confirmation page that says, thank you for your order. And you could assert 
that the uh, text, thank you for your order, is present on the page. In this case, we're just going to navigate to the online boutique homepage URL. So I'm going to grab the URL of the online boutique and I'll paste it into this URL field. And I'm going to remove the protocol. And since the protocol was HTTP, I'm going to change it here as well to HTTP. I'm going to update the description of this step to uh, go to home page. One thing to note is if I click here, I can actually organize the steps so I can insert additional steps before or after this step. Uh, I can copy it or I can delete this step. And before even finalizing this test, I can actually validate that this works by selecting try now. When the test completes, it shows me the results in this page here. From this page, I can view screenshots that were taken by the runner at certain intervals, and I can even change the interval of screenshots. So right now it's set to every 500 milliseconds, but if I wanted fewer uh, screenshots, I could select every one second. And on the right-hand side, I actually get a video of the transaction as well. If I scroll below the video, I can view key metrics defining the performance of my website. This includes the core Web Vitals metrics, which offer more granularity than something like the AppDex score. But those aren't the only metrics. If we continue scrolling down, there are a large number of other metrics that we can view uh, pertaining to the performance of the website. And on the left-hand side window, we get a waterfall chart that provides the individual network transactions that occurred during this test. And each network transaction includes key metrics around the timing of that transaction. And we can expand each transaction to get more detailed information. But something that's incredibly important to highlight is this hyperlink to APM. This provides us with a unified experience when we're monitoring our application. Synthetic monitoring is integrated with all of the other Splunk products, which makes it a lot easier and more efficient to troubleshoot issues when they arise. I'll select the first APM link for this initial network transaction. As you can see, we were taken directly to the trace for that test that was just ran in synthetic monitoring. And not only that, if we identified a specific span that encountered an error or timed out, we would be able to navigate down here to related logs and navigate directly to log observer for this specific trace. So again, this provides you with a unified experience that allows you to efficiently troubleshoot your application. I'm going to navigate back to the Synthetics page. And I'm going to exit out of this test. And since the result seems satisfactory for that particular step, I'm going to select Return to Test. As you're probably already aware, it's critical to test your application from various locations around the world. And under the Locations field, you can include various AWS regions that you would want these tests to run from. Some geographic locations can have variable network conditions. If your application is primarily hosted in the Western region of the United States, then users who are in Eastern Europe or further east might be experiencing greater latency than those who are in the Eastern region of the United States. And if the latency is large enough, it might cause timeouts to the backend API. That's just one reason that you would want to test from multiple geographic locations. But there are plenty of reasons beyond just network latency that you would want to test from various locations. But that's not to say that you're limited to only testing from these AWS locations. You can actually run these tests in a private location, like on your own infrastructure or from behind a firewall. This is made possible through a runner, which is essentially a Docker container that you can run on your infrastructure and it will execute the tests that you've defined. 
being able to test from a private location opens up additional use cases for Splunk synthetic monitoring. So for instance, you can integrate uh, your runner with a CICD pipeline so that you can perform synthetic monitoring on a pre-production environment. You can also select what type of device this test should be run from, as well as the frequency that the test will run. Turning round robin on will make it so that when the tests execute, it will execute sequentially from each region rather than concurrently from all regions at once. And then you can make the test active or inactive. And then lastly, and arguably one of the most important steps here, is to create a detector. Creating a detector for a synthetics test allows you to alert your team when the thresholds for a particular uh, detector are met. And then from the top drop down menu, you can select the conditions on when this detector will be triggered. So you could do something as simple as testing the uptime or create a detector for uh, one of the core Web Vitals metrics like largest contentful paint. And then you would select what type of threshold. One thing I like about uh, when you're configuring these detectors is that they provide this estimated alert count over a four day period. And so this can give you an indication of whether or not the detector is uh, overly sensitive or not sensitive enough to uh, the thresholds that you are defining. I'm not going to create this detector, so I'm just going to exit out. Now, if you were to open up this sidebar menu here, you can view variables that are available to this test. So you can see under the global variables uh, section, there are multiple uh, environment variables that are added. And these uh, environment variables are available to the test during execution. And so obviously you would want to include uh, global variables that are available across multiple tests, uh, something like uh, user test user credentials so that you could test uh, functionality like login. And then if you needed to, there are more advanced options as well if you select the advanced uh, tab. So you could include things like custom headers and cookies uh, in this test. I'm going to leave everything as is and select submit. Now after creating the test, you're taken to a test overview page which provides you with uh, additional metrics to monitor uh, prior test runs. Since this one was just created, there's not many results to look at, but I have another test that's been active for longer hitting the same website, so I'm going to navigate to uh, that other test. I'm going to filter by browser test. And this is the other test that I created. And on this overview page, you can see a lot more data related to the test because it's been running for a longer amount of time. If I scroll down to the availability chart, you can see the results of each test run by location for uptime. I can also adjust this chart to view performance KPIs. So here we can see run duration by location. Or if I select this dropdown, I can specify by page or synthetic uh, transaction as well. And then in the run duration dropdown, I can specify other performance metrics to measure. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks for watching.